Welcome to Movie Caps. Today I will show you a biography, crime, drama film from 2017, that's based on a true story, titled Molly's Game. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. During a competition, an ice skier dashes downwards through a snow-covered slope. Molly narrates in the background a survey for 300 professionals about what's the worst thing that could happen in sports. As the screen pan showing the judges tallying the scores of the skiing competition, Molly further narrates that one person answered, it is placing fourth in the Olympics. Molly is called to prepare on deck. She recounts how she has been training all her life while being coached by her dad Larry, who only sees achieving the goal, with complete disregard of her well-being. She prepares herself mentally as she stares blankly while listening to her iPod. Against all odds she made the US ski team by her 20th birthday. This is the champion run at Deer Valley, last chance to make it to the Olympics. Molly shows her splendid technique as she glides rapidly yet smoothly down the slope. She explains how ironic it is that the very same pine boughs that help skiers, hit her ski so accurately it simply snaps the release of her ski locks no matter how tightly bound it is. A ski detaches just before the next ramp, sending her flying erratically in the air landing on her head. She crashes. The crowd screams and gasps in tragedy. The cameraman catches every second of it. Whoever answered that the worst thing that could happen in sports was fourth place at the Olympics, Molly offers a resounding screw you. The camera pans around the room with boxes scattered all around showing a number of her books. She is woken up by a phone call from an FBI special agent Tomasino. She is commanded to step out and approach them. Molly is harshly arrested for a non-violent crime. Meanwhile, Molly in the present time recalls how she appears to be irrationally angry during her teenage years towards nothing in particular. Eventually she finds work as a waitress at a fancy club in Los Angeles where she gets to see the rich and famous. She exhibits wit and astute behavior to convince people to spend more. Molly eventually works for Dean Keith, whom she met in the club. Dean starts using Molly to organize poker games for the rich and famous. Molly prepares the room, welcomes the players, and takes from each of them $10,000 in cash. This is where she meets Player X, who will play a very significant role in Molly's life. As the game transpires, Molly prepares the drinks. She sits in a corner realizing she just counted off $90,000 with a room full of movie stars, directors, rappers, boxers, and business titans who had complete disregard of all the money they were burning through playing cards. In a single night Molly realized that she had just found herself stuck between a rock and a hard place, earning $3,000 in tips and the opposite path of a successful law degree. In the meantime, Molly waits patiently on the couch of a posh law office where she meets Stella, daughter of Charlie Jaffe, her would-be attorney. Charlie is reluctant about accepting Molly as a client but subsequently finds himself in a stalemate, so he agrees to represent her only as a representative of a potential but different future lawyer. Following the last game at the Cobra Lounge, Player X is highlighted. Demonstrating his immense skill at poker, hence the survivability of the game will entirely depend on how other poker players would always want to play with Player X. She acquires a new place, a new ride, and $17,000 in cash. No rush for law school. While Molly and Charlie enter the Hall of Justice, Charlie describes how he is only going to represent her as a substitute lawyer. Charlie is tense about something, so much so that he keeps switching seats with the security seated next to Molly. Judge Foxman slowly calls on the defendant's cued inside the courtroom. As their turn approaches, Charlie changes his mind because of Molly's noble heart. Charlie asserts he is her counsel. During her teenage years, Molly recalls how her younger brothers have already shown signs of superior intellect and athleticism. Molly thinks highly of herself but doesn't understand why she always baits her father into a fight even during dinner time. Molly criticizes her father but ends up failing when she gets shut down by his firm tone to show respect or start living on her own. Soon, in Los Angeles, she had already saved enough and has done her part to keep her way of living afloat. Dean loses to Player X. He takes it out on Molly by confronting her and telling her that she is no longer going to be paid as his executive assistant. All her arguments to defend her rights fail. Molly is not about to let this happen, she uses her life savings to round up a venue, set up the table, organize a menu, prepare the drinks and cigars, and glamorize herself in preparation for what she expects is going to be the replacement game night before Dean fires her. Molly gets fired. The following morning, she arrives at Dean's office only to be welcomed by Leah, her replacement. She flat out lies and texted Leah with phony contact information about the game. She arrives at the Four Seasons Hotel after gathering the players for tonight. She walks in the middle of the room with a stunning outfit to tell everyone that she will now be hosting the games herself. 
Molly narrates how the players' egos are fed by winning, together with the feeling of obliterating opponents. Molly asks Jay for a minute of his time. Player X is seen wondering in slight jealousy or perhaps envy as to why Jay had to be isolated by Molly. Molly talks to Jay alone to explain how an international rock star like him can eventually end up a bottom feeder if he continues to flirt with Molly. Player X discusses with Molly how they should raise the stakes. Molly counters that too much money isn't feasible. Player X wants competition. Donnie Silverman is invited because he can easily lose to Player X. He establishes his dominance because he doesn't really enjoy the game but enjoys wiping out the competition. Brad Marion is invited because a player vouched for him, the worst poker player to ever live. Harlan Eustace is a dark horse invited by Player X. This time, back in Charlie's office, Charlie explains how three groups of Russian mafias are all tied to her because they all play in her games and that she violated the constitution by taking a part of the pot money. They engage in a debate on why Molly has to hand over her hard drives to Charlie. Charlie ultimately convinces her that he can be trusted by giving his phone as leverage. So far in Los Angeles, Molly narrates how Harlan played so well in the beginning until he got demolished by the worst player in the game, Brad Marion. He didn't lose much, but he couldn't get over it and goes on tilt and starts a massive losing streak. At that point the whole LA knew that unbeatable Harlan is bleeding and everyone wanted to get in on the action. He keeps rebuying. Molly, assuming he has money, puts it on his tab. In his final hand Harlan loses a massive pot of $750,000 against a royalty and snaps at the dealer, he later confesses that he doesn't have the $1.2 million to pay Molly. Player X reveals that he has been staking Harlan and was the same person who loaned the $1.2 million to him. They eventually get into an unpleasant argument when Player X, out of jealousy, gets infuriated. The following night, Player X has taken the game from her. Finally in Los Angeles, in one fleeting moment as she sits inside her room, she realizes that staying a loser wasn't going to cut it. She decides to go to New York and start fresh. Initially in New York, Molly recruits talented and well-connected Playboy playmates to start a ruse that Molly is now in town. She plots a scheme baiting the upper class of the Big Apple. The poker game ensues, as Molly describes her earnings close to $5 million, all obtained legally. Her latest card dealer, B, convinces her to eventually take a portion of the pot money because of an incident where a player cheated on her, and that's on top of the money owed to her by players that could no longer be found. She gives in to B's suggestion in one high-stakes game where the pot amounted to $3 million. She is now violating the law. Douglas Downey, a regular and drunkard, eventually loses and does not have the money to pay for it. Molly uses Doug to invite the big-time Russian poker players from Brooklyn. She succeeds. Mike Davidoff, Ilya, and Alexei Gershin, Shelby Habib, are business magnates in their own fields. They make the game more interesting but lose nevertheless. Molly narrates that there was no way to tell these gentlemen had deep dark secrets. Moreover, in Charlie's office, Molly waits in sentimental silence. Charlie arrives with the bad news that his plan failed. Charlie settles down and asks Molly about her father. Molly admits that she had a lot of pressure from her dad, but nothing compared to how tough she was on him. In one swift pitch that Charlie couldn't intervene, Molly says she will tell everything they need to know about her but only about her. Charlie surrenders. Back in her New York heyday, Pat, her driver and security drives her home. Molly narrates how she liked Pat because she could open up to him and receive no judgment. Pat asks her a favor to meet a couple of hedge fund guys, whom she agrees to meet at the Four Seasons Bar. She could immediately tell that these two men, Paul and John G, were barbaric debt collectors who urged her to hire them, but she declined. Her doorman tricks Molly into believing that he has a package for her. A man knocks on her door, roughs her up, smashes her head to the wall, takes her money, jewelry, and gold. The man threatens to kill her mother in Telluride, Colorado, as he explains that rejecting Paul and John G was a bad idea. Molly is on the floor swollen and beaten up, with a final kick to the stomach Molly passes out as the perp leaves with a bag full of cash. After two weeks of recuperating, in preparation for the next set of games, she receives a call from a drunk Douglas letting her know that he would never rat her out. During the phone conversation she receives a text message from her other phone, warning her to stay away because the FBI have stormed her venue. She panics and rushes to depart. Later, Molly is with Charlie inside a conference room being interrogated by two prosecutors. Henderson Wellsone, and another. She answers their questions patiently while Charlie is obviously losing patience after five hours of unsuccessful persuasion with the prosecutors. They pressure Molly to cooperate and stand as a witness against the Russian mob. To catch her off guard, 
Henderson recites the number of times her name is mentioned from Mike Davidoff's wiretaps. Charlie sneers at the prosecutor after Molly explains that they were referring to ecstasy. This triggers Charlie to go into a frenzied, ferocious, and relentless declamation enumerating the various reasons Molly could have taken advantage of, after being wrongfully harassed by the US authorities, yet she remains vigilant to protect all the identities she knew, because all accusations painted by the media and the government bear zero weight on the truth, all of which can be proven by the hard drives he possesses. Henderson abandons aggression and requests a private talk with Charlie. He instructs Molly to grab a bite. Molly steps outside sentimental, she finds an ice skating rink. She skates swiftly past the marshals who warn her to slow down. She skates faster and faster until a voice tells her to bend her knees. In a split second she looks to her left and crashes. It's her dad. They sit on a bench and he gives her three years worth of therapy in three minutes. Year one, Larry explains she chose poker over all other fields that she could have succeeded in, because subconsciously, she wanted to control powerful men. Year 2, Molly discovers the truth of why her father was always hard on her. It was the catalyst needed so he could raise three remarkable achievers on a college professor's salary. Year 3, she uncovers the truth why Larry appeared to like her brothers more over her. She had caught him cheating on her mom when she was 5 years old and even though she had no memory of it, she subconsciously knew, which caused her to act out. The year 1 statement was just a distraction to make her mad. Everything now made sense. Emotions arise, they make amends and hug each other. Charlie waits back in his office with tension in his face. Molly startles him. Molly kids around until Charlie interrupts her with a new offer from the prosecutors. She gets her money back plus interest and she walks, in exchange for all her hard drives. They engage in a heated argument because Charlie wants Molly to take the offer. Unmoved by Charlie's convincing argument, Molly assures Charlie that she would rather plead guilty than destroy more lives because her name is more valuable than getting her money back. Molly and Charlie wait in the courtroom as Judge Foxman arrives. He asks her 87 questions before he can accept her plea. Molly pleads guilty. Judge Foxman beckons for the prosecutors to approach and talks to them in private. Molly is confused. Judge Foxman casually denounces the prosecutor's recommendations for punishment. He sentences Molly with 200 hours of community service, a year probation and a $200,000 fine before adjourning the court. They are seen celebrating, joking about how nobody messes with the blooms, and talking about Christmas miracles. During this merriment and feast, she is stung by the hard reality that she has no idea what happens to her life next. Recalling what happened in the accident, she slowly regains consciousness. Molly insists she's fine and asks for help to get up. She narrates that nothing good came out of this except for the fact that she is very hard to kill. The camera passes atop the downward slope where she came from as she quotes Churchill for his definition of success, the ability to move from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. The pine bough that started all this is sticking out in the snow. The end. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this.